Okay, good evening all. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hopefully everyone's in good spirits after the game last night. I'm sure I sure am for good, for sure. So tonight, in pos our possession uh, webinar is going to be around the mid-block position specific and our main focus is going to be around the number four and number eight. Tonight I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, Ted Dow, youth coach, uh, educator, uh, former Chelsea Academy manager, uh, been with the FA many a years now. Uh, ben Futcher, uh, again, one of my colleagues, coach educator, former player, assistant manager at various clubs at League One and League Two. Uh, and in the background, we've got um, Matthew Rams, but I'm who's an FA analyst. And we've got Kate Sorensen, who's dealing with the technical side of things around that. So basically, our focus tonight is going to be on the uh, mid-block, like I said. And here's a few slides that we're going to go through just to whet your appetite. Okay, great. So we're going we're gonna to split this into to two sections this evening. So these questions that we're going to talk around are based on the stuff that you put in. Um, so the theme, first part is to be theme one. So in your coaching context, what do you think, um, or what do you consider to be position-specific requirements of a number four out of possession? And then the second part is going to be based on, are these position-specific requirements different for a number eight in your coaching context? If so, why? So we're going to start the first one. Officer Futch, I'm going to come to you with a first question. So what are the key attributes needed for a number four? Cheers, Was. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's well. Uh, yeah, very uh, excited after last, uh, last night, Was. I was fortunate enough to be there. So the number four for me is, especially from an outer possession context, is more is what I call a defensive midfield player. So the number four is just a, probably a different name for it. So some of the key attributes, as I touched on there, was at the game last night, and you look at Rice and Phillips for England, and one of the key attributes, I'd say, in the modern game, the way England play with the number four, is I think you've got to be able to cover ground. The amount of ground that them two players cover is phenomenal. So the athleticism and physical capabilities of players, is, for me, is vital in the modern game. They've got to be able to cover that distance. And then within a defensive midfield role, it can look different, was for me, whether you can you can get you can get a, a riser of Phillips and you can get a Busquets for Spain. Different different types, but do a similar job out of possession. So some of the some of the key skills I'd say are a game understanding and game knowledge, and that that develops for me over time. So especially with younger players, you can't expect them to kind of know what a thirty year old is going to know. So you've got to build that up. But that game understanding and knowledge for the position is key. I think game 
the experience you gain, so almost understanding when to press, when to protect, I think is key. I think you start looking at timing and scanning. So all these skills we've spoke about before is you need to understand where players are. So if you're protecting, where's the striker? What's the man on the ball doing? You're looking at then the timing. And I think one of the key things that a number four on defensive midfielder needs nowadays in the modern game is the ability to go and intercept. Mm. I think we were speaking before the call that Busquets is, I think he was saying, well, he's, he's the main interceptor in the, in the, in the Euro 2000s. And that's yeah. a key skill. I think in the modern game, you know, you look at big tackles and slide tackles in that middle of the pitch area. Um, for me, you can't really do that anymore. The best players now, they have the, the ability to read the game, the, the timing of when to intercept. They're almost, they're almost encouraging a pass, they're on the shoulder and they're nicking it. So then the, the, the technical ability as well for me is where when they are intercepting it, they're not giving it away. So for that, you need good in-possession skills, good technical skills to regain the ball and retain it. Um, so there's a lot of skills for me that that number four need, um, but it can be different depending on what you want your number four to do. Mm. Um, I think when you look at, at the two England lads, like I've said, your Rice and your Phillips, they've got a really good variety. F- and, f- and for me, a moment of the game can dictate what they need to do. So in certain moments of the game, they might need to go and press. So you'll see them if it's if England are on top, they're all over opponents, that they're, they're engaging, they're in people's faces and they've got the ability to go and really engage and press. But when the game requires it, they've got the game intelligence then to sit off, protect, screen and they balance across that midfield area. Um, so they have the ability to kind of do both and I think that's a real skill that, and a real benefit to the England team that them lads can do that. Yeah, I mean, I think a key a key thing for uh, for me is the interception skills, um, and to be able to you know to be to be able to intercept very well and skillfully, you need to be able to read the game. So I read where passes are going to go, show a little disinterest, and all of a sudden your foot comes out and you and you're nicking it and you're setting off an attack. So you know, although you might think that naturally a holding midfield player's yes, he needs to get around the pitch, but it's all well and good him having the ability to and the, and the energy to get around the pitch. If he doesn't read situations it can be very ineffective. So I think, you know, certainly when you're talking about interceptions, their reading ability, their sense and their feel is is really, really important as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I think that ability to intercept now is just getting it's getting bigger and bigger because, as I say, big tackles are going out of the game, especially in tournament football. Uh, you know, you get yellow cards and then you walk in a tightrope. I think that ability to intercept, and it, it's you look at, you look at Phillips when he's on the front foot, He's nipping in front. He's timing. We're looking at timing skills then and and the ability to, I keep calling it reading the game. So you, they're almost anticipating it. They're, as you said, they're encouraging a pass in. They're almost showing a pass to a certain player, knowing that it's going to go there, but they're ready to pounce and step in. And I think that's something that's really developed um, in the last few years, them intercepting skills. It's more and more, you look at the Italians, I look at Verratti and Jorginho in there. They're brilliant at it as well. So when you look at the kind of two teams we've got to the final, They've got these skills, these these midfield players, the number four, when they're out of possession, they've got fantastic ability to to protect that back four. And you look at England's defensive record and it's the back four and the goalkeeper have been fantastic. But you look at what's in front of that and they do such a good job. They do the work off the ball and they're, they're shutting um, passing lanes, they're blocking passes. And then, then when their passes do come, they're breaking up play, they're kind of intercepting it and they're regaining, they're, they're regaining possession. They're not... You know, sometimes it would call a tackle, big tackle, and you're clearing it out of play off the pitch. But now, when you're making them interceptions, was I think the the thing you look for now is you're intercepting. You know, you're looking to to regain and retain and go and start attacks as well. So I think yeah. really key point, and I think it's really something that's coming to the modern game. Yeah, I, I agree. For which I mean, certainly back in the day, certainly in our time plan, you know, you're going in for a tackle just to try and win the ball back, but you you, you potentially you go to ground to do that. Whereas now. To go into ground is not going to potentially allow you to then go and set an attack up. So stand on your feet, being able to nick it and intercept. You're on your feet, you're in, on the front foot, and you're ready to go. So yeah, I mean the game the game has changed considerably, but there is still space for tackling when when needed. Yeah. You yeah. need to go to ground, you go to ground. But I suppose it's a smarter way being able to to intercept effectively. So Ted, question for yourself: uh, What considerations do you have for your number four based on team systems and strategies? Well, I think to to support um, everything that you guys have said already, uh, I would add um, the, the 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 part where when we're in you know, pre-transition, when we're in possession, 
the, the term holding midfield player is exactly that. He needs to hold his shape and realise that he's part of that halfway line security unit, whether that be, you know, two centre-backs and the four, or whether it be two centre-backs and two fours, if you like. Um, doesn't matter, but it, it, he's got that, that that patience and restraint to hold himself back and not go gallivanting forward. And, and, you know, he's got that job to do, even though the rest of his teammates are trying to score a goal. He's immediately switched on to what if what if we lose it and what if we get countered? I, I, you know, I am the first barrier, if you like, to the counter-attack. So I need to be here and ready and, and waiting. The second thing for me that, that I thought was big listening to what you were what you were talking about was the number of times the four goes into combat uh, and, and makes contact with the opposition. Um, and in this day and age where yellow cards are flourished, you know, quite willy nilly sometimes for the most innocuous things to, to come away in a tournament and not be, not be suspended because you've got more than one yellow. I think a, a massive tribute to, to the players that, that, that you quoted, not just the English players, but also, um, the you know the other players from from other countries who who are standout players as well. Um, in t- in terms of uh, where what we're looking at in there, uh, I, I find this really tough. This 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 thing around you know the the, the model number four, um, it, it's got to be a jack of all trades for me. Although and a master of some, whereas normally you're a jack of all trades and master of none. I think you need to be something slightly different where um, the reason you're in the team is for the men- for the reasons that, that Futch has already mentioned. But I think that you win the ball back and then you either, you either give it to somebody who can pass it or you can pass it yourself. And uh, the preference would obviously be for the four to have those passing qualities as well. So to add, add to the, the stuff that's already been highlighted, I, I would, you're the conductor of the orchestra a little bit. You've got to be able to spark play from that central position. Okay. So, Ted, we've got some we've got some slides you're going to talk through as well in respect of putting people in positions and, and as to why. So they're going to come up now. Yep. Do you want to just talk us through them? Yeah. Okay. So I thought I thought it would be a good idea to talk to people about um, what you know how the shirt numbering occurred, and, and I don't mean to be. Um, disrespectful to anybody here, but I am slightly uh, greyer in the tooth uh, than most people on the call. So can remember uh, quite vividly as a 12-year-old England playing in the 66 final. So, you know, I'm proud to say this is my second final with England, not my first, which is which is the case for many of you. Um, and so the numbering occurs like this. And, and I've used the 4 3 as an example there. So obviously one is the keeper. Two is recognised as a, as a right fullback, and then three is the the left fullback. The four is our is the the player that we've been focusing on. One of the players we've been focusing on sits it there in midfield, uh, and then you've got your five and six, the two centre backs. And straight away we can see that it doesn't seem to be any logical order in this numbering. Um, and I do know that other clubs have have different ways of numbering the players. My preference is this because of coach education reasons more so than um, uh, anything else. But I, I think we all understand when people talk about a four or a two or a five, we all appreciate uh, what that is. The seven pops up up front on the right-hand side. The eight pops up uh, next to the four in midfield. There's your central striker. I think that's been common across the world. The nine has always been recognised as the central striker. And nowadays we talk about the false nine and, and I still don't know what that, what that actually is. Um, I just think it, it, does it refer to somebody who's not a recognized central striker as playing in that role? Uh, I.e. Havertz at Chelsea, for example, it, it, is that what he is? The 10 has always been regarded as the star of the show. Uh, that's the shirt that people often want. That That's the one there. I, I, I remember a, colleague of mine at Chelsea when he played in France was given that 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 shirt and on his debut was um, chastised at half time for working too hard uh, whereas in England we would praise that that work rate in France he was chastised for it and the point was made to him in no uncertain terms that his his reason for being in the team was to create and 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 do the damage in forward areas and and you needn't worry about tracking back 
and so completely different cultural approach to the philosophy. And finally, we've got the eleven uh, out out on the left hand side. So so the team for me would look a little bit like this. Uh, then I've posed some questions um, around this. What what comes? With, I'm not expecting people to. You know, this is not. We're not a school. This is not a question and answer thing. If you want to think about these things, or even put some some stuff in the, in the chat box, that then please feel free to do this. But what comes first? Is it the role or the player? So if you want a number four in your team, who is it? Uh, who fits what? Is it the player fit in the role or the role fit in the player? Um, is it possible to standardise that role? Can we come up with a set of standard attributes? Uh, Ben's already uh, already highlighted several of those attributes. Is that what we want all our number fours to have? And, and the names that were thrown in in the hat as as outstanding players in that position, are they all the same, or do some of them have slightly different uh, attributes than others? But there are some common themes throughout. And, and then the last one I put there: how how important is it for for us? as coaches to develop the skill of player profiling. Um, you know, we, we, we touch upon it when we look at the four corner model, but is, is it something that we are really skillful at? I, I know you've got a story, Warren, about uh, your experiences when you were at Dagenham. Yeah, just in respect to, to profiling players. Um, so we inherited a squad like you normally do um, towards the end of the season. Um, and there was a lad playing at right back uh, who we felt, by you know, by by when we sort of done our profiles, what we wanted our number eight potentially to look like, he fitted the bill. You know, he could get up and down the pitch, he could tackle, uh, he was very mobile. We had a good understanding of the game, we had a good sense and feel for it. So the following season, we played him there, and he flourished, um, and he went on and had a had a great season. You know, defensively, he was excellent. He was brave. He intercepted well, and he and he also added goals into the box as well. So, you know, sometimes you might have a player within your team or within your squad who may be playing in the position, but if you look at his skills, might be preferred somewhere else and, uh, and could have a real impact. So, you know, sometimes if you are in a position where you're not handpicking your players, this is the squad you've got, you can't add to that. Can you think out the box? Can you look at certain attributes that they've got? Can you try and match it up to a position? And, uh, and obviously how you want to play as a team. I think as well, to to, to add to that story, there's, there's many examples of players who, who began their, their, their football development in certain positions uh, and have ended up playing in completely different places on the pitch. In, in my experience, John Terry was one of those uh, starting midfield. John would have described himself as a dynamic midfield player. Um, but when his opportunity came to play centrally at the back, you know, that's really when his career kicked off and, and started from that moment. And that wasn't, that, that that was an accidental thing. That wasn't a deliberate, whereas you're talking, Warren, about deliberately profiling players to fit certain roles and identifying players who at that moment weren't playing in those positions. But like you said, what, to use your language, went on to flourish in, in terms of their contribution to the team and, and their own development. Yeah. So, sorry, what's going to I think there's often a trade, I think there's often a trade off Ted. So depending on the coach and how the coach wants to play or the manager wants to play, I think at any level, there is some sort of trade off of the number four. So if you want a number four, who is going to be outstanding in possession and has a fantastic range of passing, you're often trading off sometimes from defensive abilities. Whereas if you want an outstanding defensive number four who's out of possession, outstanding, they're often very competent in possession, but sometimes lack that top, top level quality of range of passing maybe in vision. And that's not being disrespectful. It's very rarely you get that, that number four who can do everything. So I always think there's a little bit of a trade-off on what you want as a coach, what you're willing to accept out of possession, but what you're going to gain in possession and vice versa. So I, I, I couldn't agree more with you there, Fooch. Uh, and that's why I posed that question on the slide there was, yeah. you know, what do we want? What do we want from the role? And it's only us that can that can ask that question because it's not a standardised set of skills, is it? It's it, it, I think there are some common skills amongst all those players that you mentioned earlier on. Um but some of them will be better, for example, in the transition and when, when possession comes along, they'll be better. Others are, are brilliant at stopping it, putting their foot in, intercepting and then lending the ball to other people to, to develop the attacks from there. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you, I, for me, I'm, just, I'm trying to link it to the Euros. I'm looking at a Kante and I'm looking at a Phillips. You know, both very energetic, go and get in people's faces. They can press, they can shield. Um, but then in possession, maybe I haven't got the... They're outstanding players in possession, don't get me wrong, but maybe I haven't got the quality of maybe a De Jong um, from yeah. Holland. 
But De Jong then hasn't got the the, the out possession qualities of a Kante or a Phillips. So it's always what you want, you know, what do you want that player to do within your team, and then what you're willing to kind of trade off. And that's always a big thing that I use that a lot is you very rarely get a player who can do everything. So don't you know you can't expect them to do everything, especially in development football. Is is you know players will be good at different skills at different times in the development. And I think as coaches, it, it's our job to almost you know to see where they need help and create the experience and opportunities for them to kind of develop and practice and. And it's quite an individual development journey, I think. And I, I think a number four, you know, often find they probably peak when they get late to mid to late twenties because they've got the game experience, they've got that game knowledge, you know, and, and things come, you know, they've been in the situations before, and it becomes just so natural where to go. So I think it's a position me. I think where, you know, you can you, you keep developing, and as you get older, you, you can potentially just keep getting better at it. I look at Busquets at Spain, hasn't got probably the legs of other lads in the tournament, but like but like Warren was saying. He's got the most interceptions. Now that's positioning himself, knowing and reading the game. He knows where the ball's going to land. He knows, he knows what people are looking to pass, and he's filling gaps and filling holes. And again, but he's got then he's got that ability and possession to dominate and dictate. So different types, and I think at different stages of uh, players' journeys, it, it can look very different. I think that I think that point you just made there about the journey. When we're talking about somebody uh, with the experience of a Busquets. You know, you, and you look at the miles on the clock that he's got, and and the quality of those miles, and the experiences that he's he, he's he's built up. He he now brings something else to that position. You know, maybe the legs aren't what they used to be, but but he brings many other qualities that maybe you know, without being disrespectful, maybe the Rices and Phillips of this world don't yet have because they don't have similar similar uh, journeys behind them and, and and can't call on that experience particularly at that extreme, you know, the, the very, very peak of the, the top end. Just going to ask you, Ben, about um, how do you think how do you think the development bring up, affects foundation phase football, for example? You know, should we be looking for number fours there or is it important to, to, to shake it up a lot and give people various experiences? For me, ver- various experiences. I don't think you need to pigeonhole positions. When we talk about what skills players need, I think you need to develop these skills just within any position. So whether it's scanning, timing, they're, they're for me skills all players need. So yeah, I think they should be developed by players just exploring. I'm, I'm, I'm personally not one for saying you're going to be a number four at nine years old. That that That's not how I don't think players can develop the best. That's just my opinion. But so I, I'd allow them to have different experiences, different positions. Then I think once they get to a level, it's like I wouldn't pigeonhole, I keep going back to the English, that I wouldn't pigeonhole um, a, a Rice or a Phillips because for, for me a Phillips can do more than one job he's more than a number four for me a Verratti probably can do more than one job but for me you've got to as they got older they've probably experienced playing as a 10 as an 8 in different positions 10 then they, they've built up an array of, and a rounded array of skills um, that allows them to do that job when they're placed in it yeah. I think yeah, just, just adding on to that I think the early part of that is really down to um to the individuals being able to read, you know, read situations. So positioning would be linked to intercepting. So from foundation phase, if you were just to really forget about defending, tackling, uh, shifting your feet, your body, just think about the first, just the first part, you know, position yourself in a great position. So you're prepared to go and intercept. For me, that can be taught a foundation phase and that could be any position. And then you can link it on and build it up as you go through the phases and as they get older. Mm. I'm just going to I'm going to shift it on now. We're going to look at some different systems. So uh, question to you, Ted, what are the considerations when playing a single or double pivot? So just things to consider we can talk about. In in, in personal terms, I always preferred uh, a single pivot. Um, going back to sort of my days at Chelsea, where, where uh, it was decreed that everybody had to play three, five, two. We went with one pivot. Uh, but that and the the profile of that pivot was uh, had to be technically excellent. Needed an engine which backs up what Foot said earlier on about the ability to run. Needed to be supremely confident in their own ability uh, and had um, the full range of passing in, 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 in their locker. So very often that tended to be the star of the show. As time went by and as we as we tried to develop younger teams younger players to play with that, we found that the single pivot was a challenge f- from a physical point of view. So that's when we introduced 
we we turned the, the the midfield triangle, if you like, we turned it round. So instead of having point down, as people say these days, um, we we put point up and put two pivots in. Pretty much split the pitch down the middle and said, "You play left side, you play right side, and and you, you're the pivots for for your various sides." Um, as you get older and you get to um, the more senior end of the game, again my preference would be for one, but that then that would be it would be a horses for courses type attitude where I'd like to think I had the resources to go in this game we need two in this game we can go with one you know we're better off with let's say two tens in this one and a four rather than two fours and a single ten uh, yeah. or a single eight and then there are even some games where you you look at um you could argue I suppose a bit with the England side at the moment mm. are they both fours are they both eights uh they I think they've got the the ability to be a bit of both they're a bit hybrid aren't they the yeah. pair of them yeah, I agree. do you do you put a ten in front of them? Do we do we have a ten, or is that cane dropping deep? You know, it's it, it's such a such a variable, fluent, dynamic situation. It's just nice to know that you've got that those options sitting in the sidelines that you could go with a double or a single if you know whatever was your preference or whatever that particular game demanded at the time. Yeah, I also think, Teddy, you know, a lot of teams, certainly who have double pivots, have got very, very adventurous fullbacks. And yeah. it allows them then to have that security behind the ball of a box four with both fullbacks pushing on. Whereas sometimes with in a single pivot, you might find it might be one fullback attacking at a time. The other one might be slightly dropped back. So, you know, so they can create that box again if they want that. So, again, I think that depends on the context of the game, the, the people who are behind. Um, and what attributes that individual has got. He can, if he can cover ground really, really well, maybe they don't need to have to double pivot. If you want, again, from the flip side of it, if your team is building and you want, if you want them to support from behind the ball, you have a double pivot, which creates more space for a 10. So there's loads and loads of different considerations as to as and why you may have that, I suppose. Yeah, and it's, it's very difficult to make a, a one-off decision based on a single piece of information. Mm. What you just highlighted there brought, took me back. I know we, you, you said we want to talk about the here and now and not not historical, but when Brazil had Cafu on one side and Roberto Carlos on the other, two very adventurous fullbacks who would spend more time probably in the final third up the other end than they did in the defensive third, the compensation was Dunga sitting in front of, of the two centre-backs uh, because those two two fullbacks had the quality to go and threaten the opposition mm. that way. So again, it, it's looking at the entire resources at your disposal and, and, and thinking of the best way in which you can you can deploy them. So what I think I think having midfield players who have got the the ability to do both, it can gives you that flexibility. And you use the word hybrid, and I, I've used that myself, Ted, where I've played with a, a holder, what we what we'd call hybrid midfield players who could do who could pretty much do everything, a bit of everything. So I'd classify Phillips as a hybrid, you know, and I think moments of a game will dictate sometimes how you want them to play. So for me, a hybrid midfield would maybe go box to box a little bit or out of possession could lock on and go and press, go and get in someone's face, go and engage. So he's got the freedom and the, the ability in, and the legs to be able to do that. But then also a moment of the game might dictate, well, actually, you know, we're two one up with 15 minutes to go. We're under pressure. Well, actually I'm sliding in next to my, other defensive central midfield player, and now my role's a little bit different. I'm using my patience. I'm, I'm sliding. I'm screening. But then, for me, that the moments of the game will can dictate. So you can almost have that flexibility if the players have got got the skills and attributes to do both. And I think that's a real a real benefit and a real plus for any midfield players who can do both. Because um, for a coach, that really does make life a lot easier and gives you that opportunity to kind of flip things and change things. You know. As, as the game changes. It, w- it would be great to be a fly on the wall in the Italian dressing room, wouldn't it? To to see how they analyse us uh, and how they perceive the qualities of Rice and Phillips uh, and whether they see them as, as you know, what level of threat do they see them as uh, or, or are, they, are they content that maybe most of the time that their play will be in front of in front of their defenders rather than running in behind. Although Phillips does does advent, you know, he ventures quite further, much further forward than than Rice does. But 
Yeah, that, that, for me, that would be intriguing. And somewhere along the line, it would be nice for us to, with our various contacts, if we could, it'll be after the final, but it uh, be interesting to see how they perceive, perceive yeah. our chances. That's the beauty of the game, though, Ted. You're picking your wits against an opposition. You kind of know how they're set up. But for this game, it's obviously a one-off final. Are people going to change tack? You know, is there going to be a little trick up someone's sleeve that's going to slightly change? Are we going to go from a two to a one? But that's the beauty of football, isn't it? You know, and as I said, that's 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 what we're that's what coaches are there for to make those decisions and know what players you've got to be able to perform within those positions within that structure. I think it's it's fairly uh, a fairly certain prediction that Gareth will go with the core of the team being the same. Um, you know, bar an injury, touch wood, that's not the case. Um, that they're all fit and able to go. The core of the team, the central core, will will remain the same. If there are any changes, it will be to. Uh, when I say the periphery, I don't mean the periphery of the team. I mean the edges of the team. You know, like in the in the Saka position, the Sancho position, that, those kind of positions. I think I think the the core has got us as where as this far, and it, and it, hopefully it will take us all the way. I think okay. just gonna sorry, Futch. I'm just conscious of time. Sorry, sorry. we're just gonna link it now to the development part. So, question for you, Futch. So, how do you develop these types of attributes within your number four? So if you're thinking about sort of trying to collaborate with IDPs or IALPs, whatever you want to call them, uh, do you want to just talk around that a little bit? I think when players are developing, I think I think these skills we've been speaking about throughout the evening, players will have different different parts of the journey like we spoke about and have different skills they need to work on. So I think, I think ILPs are important. And I think bringing them out, you know, whether that's individually or in small groups, you can really kind of home in on, on specific skills. But for me, I think... The key for when you do this ILP work is is how you link it back into the game and how you link it back into whether that's a 7v7, 9v9 or, or the 11v11 game. Because, you know, doing individual work in isolation, you know, it, it's, it, can, it, can, it, can, it can get lost for me. It's, it's how you transfer it back. So it's then, then it's your practice design. I think we're going to go on to with Ted as well. That's good. That becomes really important. But, but you can't just throw, right, we're going to do all this. I think, when you're looking at these rounded skills, it is it is trying to home in on individual players on what they need at what part of the journey. Uh, I think that's really important because someone will be really good at scanning, but then they might just kind of lack a bit of timing and the, and the decision making. So how do you bring that out within a session? But yeah, someone else might need the work on the scanning. So it's going away with the ALP piece. And I think it is working individually on how we can improve that individual player, but then bringing it back into the group and giving them opportunities to practice was giving them an opportunity to practice. And I, th- I think things like when you're out of possession and you're looking at the mid block is directional practices, you know, try and get it as close, to, <coughs> excuse me, close to moments of the game and the realism of the game as you can. And I think, especially when you hit the 11 v 11 game is you've got to get players in there and let them experiment because we're saying um, potentially number four defensive midfield players, you know, they get better as they get older, they learn, they've experienced things. They've seen a lot more, well, at a young age, let's, let's let's give them the opportunity. Let, let's go let them practice. Let's let them make mistakes. Let's let them feel it. All right, that's not gone right. Okay, I've not pinched that right. My timing's not right. Well, well, now I can have more goes and practice it. Put them put them in environments where they can feel feel comfortable practicing, learning, experimenting, and then gradually they, they can they can develop it. Then you keep homing in as they get older. You're homing in, and you kind of hopefully then they normally kind of get to a point where there's something there's a there's an attribute where they're really strong. So you keep working on that home and in. And, I, and a good friend of mine who's an academy manager said at their club, they almost, they really hope on home in on that super strength, but then they almost try and disguise the weaknesses. So make it unnoticeable because very rarely you get a player who's going to, like we said, is good at everything. So you almost home in on that super strength. Then some, as they get older, maybe in the PDP, some that they're not so, so good at, how do we hide that? So it becomes unnoticeable in the game. And kind of work on it that way. So there's different ways, was, but I think it's yeah. in, making it as individual as you can, and then linking them ILP ILP work into the group and giving them opportunity in realistic practices to kind of improve and develop the skills for me. Yeah, and I think it's quite a skill of a coach that if you've got several players that you're matching up IDPs that are going to go up against each other, you've got a player in mid block and you've got a, a creative number ten. And they're going up against each other in training. They've both got certain targets they need to reach. Let them have a go. Obviously, you've got support players around that. So you just need to be quite clever in your in your practice design, in the way you go about it. So linking on to that now, Ted. So 
how would you how would you practice these traits within uh, an effective session design? So I know we've got some slides to come up as well, Ted. So I'll yeah. let those come up, and then you can start talking around them. Okay, uh, if we just sort of summarise on on this one here, where we focused on the four and eight on this one here, we go to this uh, second. Just some more questions again for for the for the audience to think about uh, here. You know, how do we decide? It's become very evident now that, that you've got to make a decision based on, on, on what you want and what's at your disposal. Uh, and, and there's some questions. I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, people can read them for themselves. Uh, but sometimes, you know, what you want is you can't have. Uh, and that that refers back to Warren's story about um, when he was working at, at that other club with with the player you, you profiled and ended up putting somewhere else. And then finally, uh, this diagram, this, I just put this in uh, as something that people might want to think about. Uh, if, if you needed a model where you could just jot down your thoughts, I, I just put this in and went, okay, what are the attributes of an eight in possession, out of possession? What do they, what do they need to be able to do during transition? Blah, blah, blah. The same with the four. Uh, I'm not, not going to pretend to put all the answers in now. That It's just a model that people might want to ad adopt or, or design their own, you know, should feel free to do that. But um, you, you've certainly got to have, you know, what would I like against what have I got? You've got you've got to have that be in a position where you can weigh those two things up. What would we like to have and what have we actually got and how close are we to, you know, are those two things together?